Today, we'll, we will be covering the emotional drivers behind weight gain and obesity. Welcome back to the Mind Change Podcast. I'm your host, Heather McKean. Please take a moment to like, subscribe, download, comment. It really helps us to continue to create all the great content for you and others and lets us know if we're meeting the needs of our community. It's important to remember that most of the conditions that we cover in this series are more of a chronic nature. This is especially true in this case. While there may be some overlapping triggers or drivers behind a sudden spike in weight gain, what, will we, what we will be talking about today is more of the long-term propensity for weight gain or difficulty losing weight and obesity. Now, the World Health Organization defines obesity as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that presents a risk to health. The body mass index or the BMI over 25 is one of those indicators. Now there is a lot of talk, a lot of argument around all of this. Um, clearly it's known and shown that we are getting bigger, have been getting bigger as a society. And despite a growing awareness of body positivity, obesity is still a life threatening condition. It's shown to increase the risk of several debilitating and deadly diseases like diabetes, heart disease, and some cancers. And one published st study shows that the average years of life lost from obesity is six to 10 years. And that makes obesity one of the top causes of death in the United States. So it's easy to see that obesity is dangerous. What is not easy is determining the cause and helping people overcome it. One thing is very clear, the link between obesity and trauma. The NIH, or the National Institute of Health, reports that 87% of studies done on obesity report that adverse life experiences or traumas are a risk factor for developing obesity or disordered eating. More precisely, a positive association between traumatic experiences and obesity and PTSD and obesity are found respectively in 85% and 86% of all studies. So what does that say? That science now has shown us irrefutably that there is direct correlation between past negative experiences or trauma or what we like to call in mind change, perceived negative experiences with weight gain and obesity. So really, when we're talking about numbers like 85, 86% in the world of research, those numbers are astounding. And what people are finally beginning to realize is it goes so far beyond a calories in, calories out mentality. Trauma and adverse childhood experiences have the potential to change the way our body deals with metabolism and fat storage. This is why most diet and exercises, exercise programs eventually fail in the long term, because the trauma has to be addressed for any real lasting change. Though weight gain and obesity can occur as a result of many types of trauma, we're going to be looking at some of the most common primary drivers. And a particular type of trauma that is very common in cases of, ob of obesity, uh, and though this, what I'm about to say, is never meant to be taken as a direct cause and effect, there are too, far too many studies to preclude it. That is sexual trauma. Research suggests that there is a direct relationship between physical and sexual abuse and extreme obesity. In fact, in the 1985 landmark study, now known as the ACE study, 
Dr. Vincent Felitti made a startling connection between obesity and sexual trauma. With over 50% of the participants that he had in his obesity trial reporting childhood sexual abuse. And the numbers are actually thought to be much higher than that due to the stig stigma around reporting childhood sexual trauma. Now, more recent research suggests that childhood sexual abuse increases the odds of adult obesity between 31 and 100%. Again, guys, those numbers, if you read research papers, they're just astounding. So if you have sexual trauma in your history and struggle with weight gain or obesity, that is always the first place I would start. Now, interestingly, where you carry excess weight can actually be a further determining factor about what the body's trying to say. But for now, we're going to approach generalized obesity or weight gain and the drivers behind that. So the first and most primary driver that the body is trying to say when it's doing obesity or doing weight gain is there's a deep subconscious need to protect yourself from any further harm. So your body is creating layers of protection. Now, for people who are doing this, there's also typically a good deal of repressed grief and loss stored within the mind and body. It's maybe difficult for you to have found supportive, reliable, and loving relationships in your adult life. This could be romantic, but it can also be within friendships or careers. So the thought here is that you frequently feel that you give much more than you ever receive. You may have a deep feeling or sense of emptiness within you. And you may try to fill it up with food, shopping, people, work, hobbies, collecting, but you still end up feeling empty inside. I think it's important just for a moment to realize it's not like people are, you know, who are obese are going around being like, I feel empty inside. In fact, which we'll talk about even later, is with obesity, such a layering occurs within the body, but also in the mind. So it's actually quite a bit more difficult for people who are morbidly obese or have been dealing with obesity for a while to even have any sense of what they're deeply feeling or believing because of the layering process. There might be a hyper-vigilant awareness of what people might be thinking about you. Uh, there, that could be um, not only of the way you look, which is clearly pulling us back into a cycle because that's going to happen, but really just more about what people are thinking about us in our, pres in our presence, being around us. So it even goes deeper than what they think of our appearance, but rather even deeper of like who I am as a person. And there's a, there's a heightened state of awareness of that. Now, for those people, they don't understand it's a heightened awareness or hypervigilance. To them, it's so normal to be in constant thought of what people are thinking or feeling around you. That's their norm. So they don't understand that it's actually a hypervigilance and that not everybody else is doing that. But again, vicious cycle, because they're doing that all the time, they're constantly perceiving negative thoughts and feelings around about the people in their lives or the people around them. Therefore, they are getting more and more hurt, which means they need to layer up even more. For people who are doing obesity, they might find it difficult to express or communicate what they need because, again, it's hard to understand what you need when you avoid going deep with yourself. And oftentimes what, what I've found in working with people with this condition is part of it is they're afraid to go deep with themselves because they are so layered up emotionally. But if we can get in there, they're afraid of what they're going to find. They really, over time, they've been layering and burying for so long that there's a perception that what's under there is way worse than what it usually turns out to be. But that fear keeps them in a process of not wanting to go any deeper into their lives. These people might find it difficult to let go when someone hurts 
them or lets them down. Um, and what's typical is you won't say anything. In fact, you'll put on a friendly face and be like, oh no, it's okay, it's all right. But deep down, you're holding on to resentment and anger because you've never been felt like you were allowed to show that kind of anger or have that anger because you already feel distanced from people. You already feel unacceptable even maybe before you began to gain the weight or even when the weight gain was, was, was less. And so to have people hurt you, you're not going to say anything about it because it's only going to further that fear of rejection or abandonment that you're already dealing with. Another common thing is you frequently feel that when things get good, you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. You stuff away the good feelings to prepare for the rainy days that you are just sure are ahead. But even then, you feel underprepared and overwhelmed when things get hard. So it's never enough. So let's think about it metaphorically. If you store away the good, waiting for there to be bad, that really is in one sense metaphoric for our, your metabolic condition where the food that you take in is usually stored right away as fat. It's not being used for energy. It's just stored as fat. And that's that storing away for possible starvation in the future or possible rough times in the future. It's really a maladaptive usage of our um, metabolic situation. Okay. Another one is you may not only consume larger amounts of food, but things. So this is one of those areas where um, it's not always that people are con consuming larger amounts of food. It's sometimes typical that the food that they are consuming might be what we might think of normal portions, but what their body do is doing is pulling out all of the fat from it. Not fat as a macronutrient, as much as of what is going to be stored and how the food is going to be used and stored. And so that does happen though sometimes with food where uh, obviously there is correlation between how much you eat and the calories you do put in and what you get stored. The overconsumption of calories is going to be one of the contributing factors. So it is common sometimes for people with obesity to consume larger amounts of food but they are also generally consuming more things. So sometimes that um, collection of stored fat leads to a metaphoric outward projection of stored things. So it, it is not uncommon to find someone who struggles with obesity to also be what we might consider a hoarder or a serious collector that will be comorbid alongside of the obesity. So for these people though, they may fear being controlled or dominated by another. So think about if they do come from a history of abuse, especially sexual abuse, where they've been, um, where they were helpless to do anything about it, where they were dominated or controlled. Uh, there's a deeper fear actually of losing control. So this is a really interesting thing that happens. It can be hard to understand, but what, what's going on is it creates a push-pull dynamic where you'll keep people at a distance, but also you seem desperate for help, direction, and protection. So you're projecting out this inability to regulate yourself or to take care of yourself in a, in a great way, and yet, and that's because you want people to come in and give you the care, the protection that you so desperately needed as a child. And yet, as an adult to keep you safe, you've done this layering process metaphorically with your body and it's to keep people away, keep people at a distance because the known experience is if people get close, they hurt you. And so that can be, that's what's playing out in your mind and body on a daily basis. And that is an enormous amount of energy happening. So often what happens with these people is um, you put on a happy face. So you may even become the funny one in an effort to encourage people to stay around you. 
but deep down, you still feel unwanted and unwelcome. So the false projection of funniness and happiness only uh, keeps intimate people from knowing what's really going on around you because this is the way you seem and everyone's like, oh, he's always so happy. He's always so carefree. He's always so good. You know, things are always going so well with her and even the, the people closest to you. But even though you're projecting that, you are using it subconsciously to confirm your deepest fear about yourself, which is that you're probably unlovable and that you need to do something or perform in a certain way to keep anyone around you. Now, food, the, the relationship with food with this whole thing can be very interesting because food can feel like a friend or a comfort or a reward. But the relationship with food ends up mimicking the trauma relationships that underpin the obesity. See, the food that is supposed to nurture you and give you strength ends up being the thing that actually hurts you or causes pain and restriction or even can kill in the end. Because it's very common with obesity that the kinds of foods that are consumed or the kind of foods that are craved are not really food at all. It is synthetic things. It's food-like substances. It's very, very high in sugar, commonly very high in fat. And the, the reason being is you get spikes of endorphins. That's what you're really after. And so you're getting very little nurturing uh, or nutrients from the food. So you're not really getting strength from what you're ingesting. This is very similar to the situations that you had in your relationships as child, as a child, the people that were supposed to give you nurturing and love and support ended up being the ones that hurt you the most. And you're playing that relationship out with food. And so you're using the food to overcompensate for the lack of love, joy, nurturing, and acceptance is, that you needed as a child. Very common in obesity, there's a strong correlation with deprivation. So if someone has spent a long time being obese or has in one sense given up changing, then these people go into a little bit of a different manifestation of the character of obesity, where in the beginning, people tend to be um, jovial on the outside and happy and funny. L over a long period of time of being obese, people then tend to become passive aggressive. They become mistrustful of others. Eventually, they can come across cruel, greedy, manipulative. And this is because all of the weight and the layers that they've put on and kept on for so long still have never helped them feel safe or fulfilled. So instead of changing, they become angry and embittered. Now the childhood experiences that can contribute to obesity are varied, but here are some of the most common. So a primary caregiver in your life was unwilling or unable to provide the level of love and nurturing you needed. One or both parents may have been emotionally unavailable or even physically abusive. As a child, then your needs were rejected, ignored, or at the very least not prioritized. And you may have linked special times or special occasions, the love that you felt and the connectivity that you felt and the times that were almost like a break from the madness that, that was typical in your home with food. And so that's something that children are very good at, are making links in their mind. And so if, let's say at Christmas, there's a particular time where there's a release of the constant stress in your home, or the deprivation is offset with more, more food, more presence, or more time together, more time off, then, and then there's uh, an increase in the types of foods that you're eating at the time. They're, they're a little more high in sugar, a little more high in fat. Then the food that you consumed at the time 
becomes linked with those things that you desperately needed in your emotional well-being. And because in the day-to-day, -day, your caregivers could not give you what you wanted or needed, the dopamine release that you get from the food became your caretaker. Now, unfortunately, the endorphin release that comes from food is short acting and is um, in, in one sense a little bit more synthetic. So it was never meant to replace loving, nurturing relationships. So typical for children who develop obesity in their adulthood, they were starved for attention and relevance in their childhood. And because they were made to feel small or unimportant, they felt helpless to change their environment. So the food was used as a love substitute and the weight gain became useful to provide more places to store all of that grief and anger. Now, if your eventual weight gain was met with criticism or shame, the deprived nature of the child still views this as needed attention, even if it was hurtful. So the body links weight gain with increased attention. So a, a little bit more specific around that, let's say you grew up in a home that maybe your mother struggled with her weight or has a very, um, or your father uh, has a very maybe disordered relationship with their own body and with food. And so you begin to gain weight as a protective mechanism and you, that weight gain is met with attention, criticism. They're hyper aware. They're looking at what you eat. They're, you know, making sure you're exercising or, or you're, you're getting taken to the doctor or even, even if you're being shamed and criticized, you're being focused on. And so for that starved child, that becomes a way of getting attention. So no way are you going to stop gaining weight if what it's resulting in is increased attention. Again, even if we consciously know it's not good attention, a starving child will take what they can get. Subconsciously, the body felt like the layers would be useful to protect you from hurt, pain, even unwanted advances or environments. And even though the body got bigger, that vulnerable inside self was kept safer under all of the insulation. Now your parents or caregivers may have communicated um, fear-based lack, right? So if there wasn't enough money or food or care or time, then your body was taught to hold on to every calorie as a way to be less of a burden to your parents. And again, this kind of thing has a profound impact on a child's developing metabolism. If you were hurt, abused, taken advantage of as a small child, your body may have decided that being small isn't safe. So it has equated being bigger with being safer. It's possible that your mother may have been present, but anxious, worried, or controlling. She may have smothered you out of fear instead of mothering out of love. Now, in this case, you may have feel, felt overly watched, picked apart, and controlled. And even in homes like this, oftentimes gaining weight may have been taboo. So it was the small, seemingly innocent way of maintaining some of your own identity and sovereignty over your life. If, um, you know, weight gain uh, in your family was judged or there was a lot of pride taken in being fit and healthy, and yet you felt that you were way overly controlled, way overly um, judged, criticized, picked apart, then you may have gained weight as a taking a stand. Not consciously, remember this is subconsciously, uh, and it was a way to gain some sort of control or some sort of sovereignty over what happens to you. Over time, though, the criticism that that garners becomes too much to bear. And so then the body ups the effort of weight gain 
to insulate from the pain of the criticism and the ostracization of what it feels like of the family. Underneath all of this is a child who is starving for love and acceptance. The food becomes the love substitute, very similar to a drug that you become dependent on. And while food continues to be the source of love and comfort, you will have a very difficult time actually connecting intimately with others, but more importantly, with yourself. If abuse was present in your childhood, you may avoid connecting in particular with a gender of the parent you felt, felt most hurt by when choosing a romantic partner. So if, for instance, you grew up and it was, uh, you were hurt by a male or you were abused by a male or there was a very domineering, controlling, fear-causing person in your life who was male, the subconscious mind might link that. And when you go to choose a romantic partner, a male is not going to be an option for you if again, subconsciously, this is linked to so much danger. Um, on the other hand, if it was a female, then, uh, you know, that, that may be the same, the, the same case happening that of course you would not choose a romantic partner who was a female if that was, uh, being represented in this way that can also happen though with women, with friendships, um, and men with who they decide to be friends with or who they bring in. Really, this is about not just a romantic partnership with anybody that you bring in intimately. You may be very afraid to bring in someone of the same gender if you were very, very hurt by that person and it's not been resolved. Or if you've developed further proof over the years of um, can, you know, other similar hurts and abandonments by that same sex. So overall, Rejection, abandonment, lack of childhood nurturing, those are the most prevalent drivers behind obesity. And isn't it interesting to note that in a study that researchers at the University of Montreal um, uh, and the St. Justine Hospital Research Center showed that actually so they made this connection that young children who attended daycare from a very young age on a regular basis were actually 50% more likely to become overweight as adults compared with those children who stayed home with their parents. Now, what does this tell us? Um, is this necessarily saying anything negative about daycare or parents who work? It's not that as much as understanding that even other studies are showing this correlation with obesity into a lack of um, feeling like their people are getting the nurturing and the connection that they need in their early childhood experiences. So our environments as children have an undeniable impact on our current health and well-being. And again, the main reason that diet and exercise fail to be a long-term solution for obesity is that the primary drivers for the obesity are largely ignored. Now, the way out of this condition, as with most instances of disease within the body, is by going inside, inside the mind, inside the subconscious programming that helps us develop these conditions. What we are going to go after if we do the work is those initial received or perceived messages from parents or caregivers that communicated a lack of support. When we can rewrite, rewrite and rewire those messages, we can then input something different in there. In the end, our goal is to put the power back where it belongs, back inside of you. This means that you will be the biggest support for you. So I look forward to seeing you guys every other week to dive into this continually fascinating topic please make sure to leave those five-star reviews, comment on a disease, symptom, or ailment you would like to hear covered in this series. And please share these episodes or other podcast episodes with people you never know who it's going to reach and who it's going to help. Until next time, thanks for joining us on the Mind Change Podcast, where we are changing the world one mind at a time. <laughs>